hear the lyric of that song, and it's, it's uh, very indicative of the way in which I think the universe is trying to communicate to you and I. And if we only, only listen, if we only see. Um, I, I read something similar to that in terms of in psychiatry, they have this term. It basically says that not everyone is psychologically minded. All that that really means is that there are people who do not think that what is staring them in the face has any significance or meaning or relevance or important, and yet it has major, major significance. Living in, let's say, situations of abuse and refusing to acknowledge that. Hoarders who live in vile conditions, but they have absolutely no concept of their deteriorating environment. People steeped in debt who continue to spend beyond their means. So when this issue is called out to them, uh, these people, uh, the, the person who is suffering the abuse, let's say, is unable to, to, to name it or to claim it as a part of their experience. The hoarder cannot see the environmental problem even when the clutter is creating a prison for them. And it's actually welcome, welcoming for them an existence of extreme isolation. And the debtor will continually feel a void, but will neglect substance, will neglect the choice of substance over things. And so when we think about that, this idea of not being psychologically minded, when, when something's being held right in front of our face, and we either can't or we refuse to see that, it reminds me spiritually of what we call mental equivalence. You realize that before you and I can ever experience a thing, we have to have a mental equivalent of that thing. The mental equivalent simply means that in the power or the realm of mind, you could even call it imagination, the way in which you process and think, you have to have become accustomed to having that thing before that thing that mental equivalent can actually be uh, experienced in the realm of form. And so when your life is built around a, uh, a, a sense of retaliation and anger, you and I then have a mental equivalent of that. The mental equivalent, if left unchallenged, if we're not psychologically minded, then life continues to bring you unrelenting opportunities to fuel that anger. Your body is deeply affected then by this mental equivalent. You could see that the, the arteries begin to harden and the arthritis begins to set in and there's a very crippling nature. The life force is literally being squeezed out of us through this process of the mental equivalent of our anger. People who consistently complain, there is a mental equivalent for that. And so the beauty and the consistency of a mental equivalent is that if psychologically minded, this is, this is shown to you and it doesn't, it goes in one ear and out the other, then what happens is life continues to offer us more things to complain about. That's the beauty of life. That's the consistency of life. You or I could tell someone to think differently. We could even model a different behavior for them. But if, again, they are not psychologically minded, as that psychiatrist termed, then they will refute your suggestions, claiming that their issues are not caused by them. That that mental equivalent, I, I know nothing of a mental equivalent. All that I know is that they out there, the, the collective they, are doing something to them. So spirituality then speaks of this as a level of consciousness. That's the term that we use. It is why we do what we do, when we do, and the continuance of the doing is, is a person's level of consciousness. So instead of calling it psychologically minded, you could simply call it spiritually aware. And awareness then is cultivated. Awareness is actually already fully existent within us and what we are doing, the cultivation isn't actually about making it happen. It's removing the barriers to its existence. That's when we say that you are already pure. There is a part of you that has never been violated. Spiritually aware then is getting back to that place of purity. And why? Why is this so necessary? 
because we are in relationship. We are in relationship to the world and to people and to things, but we are also in relationship to self. And the highest honor, the highest honor and the innermost deepening call that is reverent for us is to get back into right relationship with self, to get back to being either psychologically minded of the purity and, the, and the, the importance and the validity of you as a being, or to get back to that place in spirituality terms into the level of consciousness that realizes that what you are is a vessel and an emanation and incarnation of something divine and holy. And you've often heard me say that how we do anything then is how we do everything. And that goes, that bodes very well for the, the topic of relationship. So the way in which I relate to myself, inexplicably, inexcusably, without, without any other uh, kind of wedging or variance whatsoever, the way that I am in relationship to myself is the way in which I am in relationship to all other beings. And I might think that I'm very crafty at being able to hide my self-loathing and then pretend that my relationship to you is something different than that. I can pretend and think that my, my uh, level of admonishment and my discord within my family dynamic, that relationship, I can keep under wraps. But then I can pretend that I am in relationship in a whole different level with the other people around me. But there is an inconsistency to that which must reveal itself. And so when you think about the fact that the way we do relationship with ourselves is the way we do relationship with everything and everyone around us, also means that the way in which I have a relationship with myself is the way in which I have a relationship with what I call or term God to be. So the theme... The theme for today was we believe that God is personal to all who feel this indwelling presence. We believe that. We believe that God is personal to all who feel, feel this indwelling presence. I can't feel anything that I'm not in relationship with. I can't feel in the purity of that which is the indwelling presence of all intelligence, of source. I can't feel that. I can't understand that. I can't name that if I'm not psychologically minded or in tune with that thing. I can be told about it, but I will not have a very visceral, a very palpable sensation and, and relationship with that because I don't have that with myself. So in order to have a relationship or an experience with something of value and importance, you and I must become what it is that we want to attract. You and I must become what it is that we want to attract. So in terms of the essence and the quality of what it is that we're seeking and longing for, we must become that. If what I'm searching for is happiness, I must become happiness. I must have a relationship with the eternal happiness that exists inside of me. If I want to become prosperous, I must, if, if I want to have that, I must become prosperous. I must attract that level of consciousness within me before I can ever attract it outside of there. That's the way in which it works. It's not the other way around. And so the way in which we are in relationship with any and all sentient beings is indicative of the way in which we have a relationship with ourself. What I've realized is that the more that I return to that purity and that nurturing and that loving sense of self, my idea of God changes. You ever notice people who are angry with God? I'm angry with God. I blame God, this thing, because it's, it's very convenient. But where is that anger originating from? The anger within themselves. So I have to be able to project that. I have to be able to get that out. When you look and see that kind of anger, what you realize is that they are not psychologically minded in understanding or they are not spiritually aware of realizing that the origin of that is directed towards themselves. So anything that is incongruent with what I am, I want to get it out. 
Anything that is incongruent with my spirit, even if I'm unconscious of its congruency, I, I, its incongruency, I want to get it out. That's why we lash out. That's why we project. Because that pain is foreign to the purity of our being. So I want to get it out. And so when we are presented that, when the mirror is held up to that, and we are said, you have an opportunity to change that. Does it just travel in and go in one ear and out the other? Or is there something within our awareness, within our ready consciousness, that is willing to stop and take ownership of that and begin to change the behavior? So we believe that God is personal to all who feel this indwelling presence. If you're not feeling it, it's not that the indwelling presence isn't there. Where's the disconnect? It's that I'm not able to feel that for myself. So we see that there are, there are polarities within relationships. We've got functional and dysfunctional. Functional and dysfunctional relationships. And when I think of what it is but in the chasm of that, that, that could be definable, I think that it's a continuity, a continuity of honoring. If I'm dysfunctional in my behavior, there is a lack of continuity with regards to my ability to honor those things around me. If I'm functional, I'm cognizant of the fact that every single day I have the opportunity to take my honoring and to raise it, to level it, to practice it, to honor it. So you see this idea of being in relationship, then your relationships begin to change dramatically. And what you thought was the cap or the ceiling of the way in which you relate to the world suddenly begins to bust through. That glass ceiling just uh, shatters. And that which was your, your ceiling becomes your floor. And you begin to stand on a whole different level of foundation. And you begin to upgrade and up-level your particular way in which you relate to people. You could almost even say that if you are consistent in this, there's no such thing as a comfort zone because you are continually busting through that comfort zone. You and I then are moving at such a rapid pace. There is a, there is a, a, a celestial speed up by which you and I are gaining and expanding in consciousness that we don't reside anywhere in stagnation long enough for it to have an impact upon us physically or emotionally because you and I understand, oh my God, I've been given this particular lifetime, this, these capsules of 24 hours to be able to prove these principles. I have the opportunity to realize that in me is something indwelling. And that which is indwelling with me is powerful. It's all-knowing. It's in integrity. It has the ability and the capability of doing things far beyond what I've given it credit for. I want to be in a relationship with that. I don't want to be in a relationship with who do you think you are. And when I begin to dissolve that particular thing, again, I'm busting through ceilings and I'm letting those ceilings become the foundation. And that cycle or that spiraling up is ongoing because there is a continuity. There is a continuity within my honoring. My original teacher, Maureen Hoyt, used to use this phrase. She said, if you were arrested for being a mental scientist and you were put on trial, would there be enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> and that was the idea of living, living the principle of living that continuity. So I came across the story of a man who was being tailgated by a very stressed out woman on a busy boulevard. Suddenly, the light turned yellow just in front of him, and According to the law, he did the right thing. He, he stopped at that crosswalk, even though he probably could have zoomed past it in that fraction of a moment and accelerated through the intersection. Well, the tailgating woman was furious. And she honked her horn, screaming in frustration as she missed her chance to get through the intersection, which then she dropped her cell phone on the ground and then the purse with all the makeup went down into the bottom part of the thing. <clears throat> Somebody clapped because they just did that this morning. <laughs> so as she was still in this sort of, of, of continuing rant, she heard a tap on her window and she looked up to see the face of a very serious police officer. And the police officer uh, offered her to exit her car with her hands up. 
and he took her to the police station where she was searched, where she was fingerprinted and photographed and placed in a holding cell. And after a couple of hours, a policeman approached the cell, opened the door, and she was escorted back to the booking desk where the arresting officer was waiting with her personal effects. He said, I'm very sorry for the mistake. You see, I pulled up uh, behind your car while you were blowing your horn, while you were flipping off the person in front of you and cussing a blue streak at him. I noticed the what would Jesus do bumper sticker on your car. I noticed the choose life license plate holder. I noticed the other follow me to Sunday school bumper sticker, as well as the chrome plated Christian fish emblem on your trunk. Naturally, I assumed you had stolen the car. <laughs> so a continuity of honoring <laughs> means that when we honor, when we honor people, when we honor people, first and foremost, we listen. We listen to them. And when we follow through with what it is that we say that we're going to do, we keep agreements. And when we relate to them, we relate with kindness and genuine support. That is the goal. That is what you and I strive for. Are we 100%? No. But in the continuity of honoring, when we begin to choose that in our, that moment, then the relationship with self changes, as well as the relationship then that we have with the indwelling presence. We can see it more. We can feel it more. It becomes more real for us. So we believe God is personal to all who feel this indwelling presence. Let's add that you cannot feel an indwelling presence of something that you and I are not consistently in functional relationship with. You cannot feel something that you and I do not have a mental equivalent of. We cannot feel something that we are not psychologically attuned and aware of. And so what does it mean to feel? Ernest Holmes, our founder, said that we feel then this to be true when we understand the integrity of the universe and that sooner or later all things are working out as planned that's how you feel it when you believe wholeheartedly in the integrity of the universe i want you to sit with that for a minute because when you believe in the integrity of the universe that doesn't mean that you are a passive passenger within life. It means that you are very much involved in the workings and the day-to-day -day activity and relationships of our world, but you do so not fighting against something again, but understanding that the integrity of the universe has your back. And the integrity of the universe has the back of all creation. And so we do not fall prey then to the hysterical projections that sometimes we fall prey to. But more importantly, you understand the validity and the value of you. You wake up and you say, the integrity of the universe has my back. When I understand that, then my relationship to self and thus my relationship to that which is the indwelling presence is not something that is, that is con conceptual. It is something that I am able to feel. It's hard and, and, and challenging sometimes to, to speak or try to define that, to define a feeling until you feel it. I could give you a lecture on what pizza is, but unless you've eaten pizza, it's going to be conceptual. I can give you a lecture on what it means to feel the indwelling presence of that which is God. But until you begin to take a risk and step out of your limited thinking, to begin to disassociate yourself from your self-incrimination and your self-loathing, and begin to understand that the integrity of the universe is the very thing that designed you. The 
integrity of the universe is that which designed our solar system. It is the same thing that designed you, purposefully you, beautifully you. Flawed in our humanity, absolutely, but you are a part of a mold that spiritually is perfection. And that's what it means then to get onto this roadmap of understanding the value of right relationship. And so it is said that one of the main things that we as human beings long for more than anything else is simply to be happy. And what is happiness? It's a product of right relationship. When I am in, in integrity with myself and when I understand that the integrity of the universe has my back, why would then I choose to spend any inordinate amount of time in worry and anxiety? Because what is laid before me is the opportunity to live and to breathe and to be in joy. That joy or that level of happiness is, is that what you want? Is that what you desire in your life? Then go do that thing. Just go. You don't need to know how. Just march forward. Just step forward. Just put the bags, the baggage down of can't long enough so that you can just go just a little bit further. Take your bloody knuckles off the fence of familiarity and begin to move into the mystery just a little bit. Because there, in the journey of that, yes, you will sweat buckets. But as you're moving forward into the, into the mystery and into the unknown, you will begin to tap into a happiness and a level of joy that cannot be experienced, that cannot be felt unless you and I first take that move. Happiness then. Ernest Holmes wrote that the indwelling God is the single factor in our lives. It means that there is nothing between us and God. Isn't that amazing? This philosophy we teach that there's no need for an intermediary. There's nothing, there's no intercessory uh, entity between you and what your relationship with your God is. Because what is told is that it's one and the same. And so the indwelling God is the greatest single factor. It means that there's nothing between us. There is no intermediary. There is no place to go to find God. God already exists in the midst of us. And if we would try to seek it elsewhere, it would be like God trying to go hunt for God. God is not lost. And neither are we lost or separated from that which is God. The more completely then we are able to see this in everything, the more completely the will of that one God is within us and it's revered, then it responds in accordance to us. How many of us are looking for it someplace else? And it's fine to go off on a journey. I, you know, I tell my students all the time, I said, it's great. Go to India, shave your head, go sit at the feet, eat vegetarian food and cross leg and om, all that you want to. That's incredible. And, and. Whatever you think that you're going to glean from that experience, please understand and consider that experience is here right now. That person that you want to come in and fill that void, that's wonderful that you have a longing for companionship because that's natural. But if you're thinking that that person is going to fill some emptiness inside of you, you have set yourself up and you have set that other person up too. Because if they're not psychologically minded and you're not psychologically minded, then you've got two absent-minded coming together. <laughs> and so whatever it is that you think is in the realm of the external that is going to make you happy, you have misunderstood your mission. The indwelling God to be in right relationship with that, to feel that, simply means to sit and to be at peace with your whole reason for being. And I, and I always love this word, and. What do you want to do with that? How do you want to express that? Where do you want to go with that? What limitation that you have assigned yourself to do you finally want to unassign? Because there is that opportunity and that, that availability and that innocence which longs to breathe inside of you. 
A kindergarten teacher was observing her classroom of children while they drew, and she would occasionally walk around to see each child's artwork. And as she got to one little girl who was working very diligently, she asked, what are you drawing? And the girl replied, I'm drawing God. And the teacher paused and said, but no one knows what God looks like. And without missing a beat or looking up from her drawing, the little girl replied to her, would you just give me a minute? <laughs> I'll show you. Because, obviously, there was an indwelling presence and a relationship with what that means to her. And so if we simply had the realization of that, there's a question for you. If you didn't believe what you believe about yourself, what would your new belief be? If you didn't believe what you believe about yourself, that you are too old for this, that you are too sickly, that you have this particular issue, that if people knew about this about you, if you didn't have that belief about yourself, what would you believe? And then would you go on the business of adhering to that belief and allowing yourself to be so psychologically minded and say, yes, I get it. To be so spiritually conscious that you say, yes, I get it. To be so willing to allow all of that limitation to become the floor that you stand on that you say, yes, I get it. That's what it is that we are here. To make that indwelling presence, to make that indwelling presence presence be felt and be real. That's what my prayer is for you. So every single week I'm up here flapping my jaws. And uh, it, it, it came to my awareness that, and it happens a lot in class, that there are people who sit in class every week who have brilliant questions. And I thought, wouldn't it be great, instead of trying to convince a lot of you to come to class, if maybe every once in a while I could convince some of you to ask your question here. Because what I know is that the question that you're wanting to ask is a question that exists somewhere else in this room. And so I don't want the leaders to ask the question. I just want somebody to ask a question about the topic of what it is that we're talking about. Do you have a challenge with that? Do you have any confusion with that? And if you're brave enough to come and ask that, come on up. I love it. Cool. Tell everybody who you are. I was going to ask after service, but so you... Pray. Why wait? <laughs> Hi, I'm Beamy. <clears throat> and it was when you were talking about creating things in your life. And I have this confusion that has been there for a while. So when you, you know, feel what you feel and you're creating, how often do you have to do it if you trust that the universe is doing it and you, you really feel it, you see it and you, you give it over, do you have to keep repeating that? Or do you just let it go once and expect it to be fulfilled? I would say that if it's a new thing, if it's, if it's a new paradigm or a new mental equivalent that you're trying to experience, I don't know about you, but I don't get it the first time around. So the way that I, I know that it's time to repeat the process is if I doubt that it's there, I go, okay, I'm going to pray for more prosperity. Ooh, I hope I get it. <laughs> if I'm hoping or if I'm questioning myself, then there's more work to do. I want to get to a place of knowing. How do you know that you know something? You know that when you go to bed at night that the sun is going to come up in the morning. That's what I mean by knowing. There's no question. There's no doubt. There's no doubt within your mind that your body knows brilliantly what to do in terms of breathing. That's knowing. So whatever new mental equivalent that you're wanting to establish, you get to keep practicing that more and more until it moves into the arena of knowing. Just like riding a bicycle or tying your shoe. I'm sure if you can think back that far, didn't you have to do it multiple times and practice over and over yeah. to the point now when we do bend over, for those of us who still can bend over, uh, <laughs> to tie our shoe, do I go, now how do I do this again? Because why? It's become instinctual. When I look at the face of a clock or I look at my watch, I don't go, now what do those numbers mean again? Because I've become so ingrained and accustomed to that particular thing. So if there's something that you and I want badly enough, 
If there's a new conditioning, a new mental equivalent that I want badly enough, then I will do whatever it takes consistently to incorporate that until it becomes instinctual. And you, you will know if something's instinctual or you will know if you're still waffling on the fence of, I really love what he says, but I don't quite fully believe it. And sometimes, too, doesn't, it, doesn't the old idea come back around just to say, are you sure you want to have that new mental equivalent? And then what do you get to do with that? Yes. I can. <laughs> <clears throat> can I share another thought sure. that came up? Because, you know, I just mental chatter. Um, so I totally get that, and that's what I believe. And then I think, if I'm not, I know that, so is it up to me to get to the place of total belief that it's happening versus trusting even though I don't believe, maybe fully, but I trust, okay, the universe is going to do it. I put it out there. Do I need to be fully there or can I trust? It's practice. It's like, you know, the whole fake it till you make it thing, right? Eventually, yeah, yeah, we all do that, but at some point you have to get to a point where you're not faking it anymore. Okay. And, and again, that comes through, you know, if this is my, if this is my mental reference point this thing it's a fence and I cling to this fence and I want what's over there but I have to do what I have to let go of this I will let go of this but I will get so far and then all of a sudden I'll strip strip and uh, strip and fall <laughs> slip and fall I might strip and fall too which would be scary and then I will run I will do what impulsively I will run back to what it is that I know and then what's my, this is the brilliant part, what's my opportunity to do it again? You know, the, the Japanese proverb says, fall down seven times, stand up eight. The standing up eight is simply representational of the fact that if I keep standing up, if I keep getting back on the horse or whatever that is, eventually I will get it and that will be my new normal. So eventually, I won't have to come back to that anymore. I will remember all the times that I did come back to that. But now I'll be in a whole different landscape where there's all these elevated conscious people that I would have never experienced or met if I had kept holding on to that. And that's, that's the work. That's what spirituality is. That's what being a light, a, a change agent means. It's that we... This is so cool. It doesn't mean that I want to pretend that this isn't here. It means that I recognize that it's here and it doesn't serve me anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not about burying your head in the sand. It's like, you know what? I'm really done with that. And this will still pop up. Like this, uh, like I'll be over here and this will be Kim going, come on, hey, hey, what about me? 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 And I go, it's fine, but you got to stay over there because I'm not going to hold on to you anymore. So it may still linger. It's like the, the aunt at Thanksgiving who is bigoted and talks a lot. She's still going to be bigoted and talk a lot, but you can say, go sit over in the corner or you can just choose the way in which you have a relationship with it. Never, never, never think that on your spiritual path, that all these problems will disappear. <laughs> they just won't be problems. They'll just be things that you get to decide differently about. So your whole response changes. Does that help? Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much. Hi, I'm David Alt, and I simply want to say thanks. Thanks for taking the time to watch our broadcast here at Spiritual Living Center of Atlanta. We have a vision, and that vision is to reawaken all to their spiritual magnificence. And one of the ways that we are able to do that is through this very medium of broadcasting. So if you got anything out of this, if you felt in any way inspired or if something spoke to you directly, then I extend an invitation to you to become a part of our family by donating. And there are many ways in order for you to be able to do that. One is to simply go to our website at slca.com 
and there you will find all different kinds of prompts that will help you support what it is that we are doing here in Atlanta. One way is to become a pledger. That means that you decide on a monthly basis that you are going to help us with this vision. Another way is to donate through our management system called Fellowship One, another through PayPal, and another even easier way is on your cell phone. You can do what's called text to tithe, and that number is 404-796-7030. Again, thank you so much for your support, and I invite you to come back weekly to see what it is that we're up to. Blessings.